With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. You might have heard tell that things that are different are not the same. It's a very simple saying, but it's very true and something I use a lot when I'm trying to do commentary or explain things or even when doing things with herd tell or other media. Things that are different are not the same. It's a very basic concept, but it's a hard concept because we always want to try to compare things, especially when we don't fully understand them. Well, we had a really good example of how that can go wrong in a hurry here recently. Commentator Dennis Pranger had made some remarks about HIV and AIDS in the 80s and 90s, comparing them to the COVID crisis of today. Uh, The bit that got him into trouble and caused a big stir online, and I'll just quote it, was, quote, during the AIDS crisis, can you imagine if gay men and intravenous drug users had been pariahs the way non-vaccinated are? But it would have been inconceivable, end quote. And now go and find those remarks for yourself. Get them in the full context. At the end of that segment, he actually maybe realizing he shouldn't have said that, prefaced it with they shouldn't have been pariahs, but by then the comments were out and folks were reacting strongly to them. This went all over social media. There was a lot of ink spill, a lot of digital writing, a lot of commentary by the talking heads, but we let's stop and just pull them apart for a second. The last time, according to Pew Research, that AIDS and HIV was the number one health issue in polling was in 2000. We're a full generation away from when folks felt that the AIDS and HIV crisis was the number one health issue in America. There's been a lot of time passed since the 80s or 90s. So instead of just reacting to these comments and diving in and going at them as we would normally, why don't we just stop for a second and consider there's probably a lot of folks that don't know what happened in the 80s and 90s with these issues. Maybe there's a lot of folks that have never heard any of this before, and maybe they just see with the current COVID crisis, they don't know what the differences are because they don't know anything about it at all. So on Herd Tell today, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to reach out to the first person I thought of when I heard these comments, our friend Dave Hubble. Uh, he's at D Plush on Twitter. He's been a Twitter buddy for a while. He's a Twitter Supper Club member in good standing. But what you may not know about David He's been HIV positive since 1985, and he's going to be able to tell us with quite a bit of authority and experience exactly what it was like in the 80s and 90s, being one of the early people diagnosed with HIV, being on the very first drug trials and multiple drug trials after that, what it was like in the communities that he dealt with, having lost friends. A lot of this is going to be a really raw conversation. This isn't the super well-produced, slick sort of conversation because a lot of this, I just left it raw because you need to just hear Dave and you need to see the face to it and you need to hear the story because again, a generation removed, a lot of folks may be hearing some of these things for the very first time. These things, diseases, whether it's HIV and AIDS or COVID, we need to remember these aren't just stats or culture war fodder or political points, or policy debates. These all involve people. So today on Herd Tell, we're going to take the controversy over the Pranger comments, and we're going to put it back, the focus back on people. And we're going to look at the people and see if we can't learn something from that. That's coming up right after this with David Hubble on Herd Tell. And I'm thrilled to get to talk to our friend David Hubble. Uh, we're going to delve into a topic that he not only knows about, but lived about, and he can instruct us on it uh, from a point of view of experience. David, how are you today, sir? Appreciate your time. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm great. Um, you've seen the comment. Uh, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but let's just take it on its premise because you've. this has been the better part of 40 years of your life now. Is there any kind of fair comparison to AIDS, HIV in the 80s and 90s and what we're doing with the pandemic now that you see? Um, In the way that people are treated? Yes. Um, So uh, I looked up the word pariah and it it, it means outcast. Yes. So, um, you know, so... I, uh, 
I donated blood in a Red Cross blood drive in 85. And um, a couple of months later, I got this letter. Wow. Certified letter from the Red Cross. And that um, informed me that I had been exposed to HTLV3, which is at that time how they referred to HIV. Mm. And the, the first thing they said, their first suggestion was, you know, follow up with your primary care physician. So I did. I made an appointment uh, right away. And um, I'm going to go back a little. So sure. when I got the letter, I remember that day so well. Um, it was really cold that day and I was on my way to work. And I opened it right away because it was certified. And it's like, I don't know how to describe It's like I wanted to sink into the ground. Right. I got this big burning sensation throughout my whole body and sort of a, oh my God, type reaction. Yeah. So, um, but I think it's important because what I did was I went straight to work. Hmm. You know, I didn't, um, I don't know. I didn't go back home or anything like that. So I just went to work. And I think that exemplifies kind of my life with this is sort of to keep going, yeah. to keep going. And um, so I went to my doctor and I showed him the letter and the first words out of his mouth to me were, you know what this means? So, you know, I was like, yeah, I know what it means. You know, I'm going to die. And because back then, yes, it, uh, HIV, AIDS uh, was a death sentence. This is 1985 you know? you're talking about. Yes, right. Okay. There was nothing. Um, there, was, there was nothing available. There weren't any medications or... There was no type of like a support group or um, no one really knew what to do. Oh, and I'm talking about my experience here in Chicago. Right. So um, somehow I found out about this uh, group. Um, it was called Passages, I remember. And it started out with about 10 of us who had all recently tested positive for the virus. And it was, um, I guess it was group therapy. And um, so out of those 10 people, I'm the only one who's still alive. You know, and they were all wow. about my age in the twenties or so. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it was a very scary time. You know, um, I was told to get health insurance. So I had, health insurance with Allstate because at that time Allstate was had health insurance and then I was eventually um, they canceled my policy so somehow they found out that I had uh, tested positive for HIV I'm not sure how they found out but the letter said that I had an irregular blood count um, according to the Medical Information Bureau which I, uh, I didn't know what that is. And to this day, I don't really know what it is because I attempted to contact them. And I mean, I never heard from them or anything. Mm -hmm. So it might have been an insurance type thing. But uh, yeah, I was devastated when I found out. And because I had been reading, you know, there were uh, gay men who were hospitalized for various opportunistic infections like PCP, which is a serious form of pneumonia. Right. You know, and a lot of guys were kicked out of their homes. You know, if they were living with their parents or with a partner, a lot of guys were just kicked out of their home. I remember the story of this one man in um, San Francisco. He was in the AIDS ward in San Francisco General Hospital I don't know, he was there for a couple weeks. And when he got home, he found, he lived alone. He found all of his stuff and belongings out on the sidewalk. Mm. So yeah, I felt very much as a pariah. 
And um, yeah, there's a lot of politics that go with it. But I think the big, a big part of that prior, uh, cry of feeling or status was just, you know, total inaction by the government. You know, I'm talking about, well, I'm talking about Ronald Reagan. Sure. You know, sure. He, he didn't talk about it for like four years. And, um, you know, I became very depressed. And with the help of a good therapist, I worked my way out of that. And, um, you know, I, um, it was about, uh, my goal then was survival and to do anything that I could to survive. So I enrolled in um, ACTG019, which stands for AIDS Clinical Trial Group for, uh, at that time, AZT, which was an old cancer drug from the 60s. And they found, they tested it and found it had some um, effectiveness against HIV. So I, uh, I signed up for this study and uh, somehow I got in. You had to have a certain T cell count. I don't remember what mine was. And, um, and I, I went to that for that to get, hopefully get on the drug because they didn't tell you, but also just for healthcare because every month I would have to go in and do blood work and have a physical uh, because I had lost my health insurance, right. you know? Right. And um, it always struck me as interesting because, well, it was at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, a, well, it's a huge state of the art. It was back then and is now facility. Oh, I, <clears throat> well, on the Magnificent Mile in North Michigan Avenue. And, um, but the study, we were in the basement in like this really little room. Um, I, don't, I couldn't tell you, like a small bedroom. And, you know, to me, that wasn't a good sign. You know, we're shoved off in the basement out of the way, you know, no one, you didn't, I never saw anyone, just the nurses there. And, um, you know, and, and then I started, they gave me a, a dose of pills to take and I started taking them. And it, they, it was in blister packs, these cap, red, and, red and white capsules. So I started taking them and then I started to vomit. They made me vomit. And uh, I was just feeling sick. And it eventually led to me um, becoming anemic. So, but I, there's like no warning that that's going to happen to you. All right. This is all you know, experimental they stuff. They, they probably didn't even know at the time, right? Yeah. Well, they kind of knew. I mean, they knew there was going to be side effects, but they, they're like, we're going to try this and see what happens with a lot of this, right? Yes. Right. Right. So I got transfused and then they put me back in, they kept me in the study and gave me more pills to take. Okay. So I took those pills. I felt a little better. I still would vomit sometimes, but I was heavily fatigued and then I became anemic again. So, um, I, you know, I went through all that and then they decided to keep me in the study. And then I found out one of the nurses told me, even though they're not supposed to tell you. So I was on the first dose was 1500 milligrams a day, which is, wow. which turned out to be five times the recommended dosage. And then the second dosage was 500 milligrams a day, which was a little bit more. And um, so the upside to that, I, I, I tried to find the upside, was that I knew I was on the drug, you know? And um, one of the measurements is the measurements of the, your T cells. And my T cells started to go up. And then they followed me and then, then you know, it became um, 
the FDA approved it uh, for 300 milligrams a day. So I had all these capsules because I couldn't go to the store. It was $10,000 a year. Wow. Uh, Burroughs Welcome. Uh, yeah, it was $10,000 a year. And activists really fought that. And they brought the price down by like 10 or 20 percent. But I still couldn't afford it. But I had I had all these pills that I didn't take because uh, they're making me not feel good. And um, Well, what I did was I punched them out of the cards so I could bring in empty cards <laughs> so the nurse wouldn't hassle me. And they're like, oh, <laughs> you're, you're not taking all of it and everything. So I don't know. So I just started to take one pill, which was 100 milligrams a day. And, um, and then that seemed to work and, you know, but, but so there was that going on, but AZT was a toxic drug and it was toxic to a lot of people. And around that time I was working for a caterer here in Chicago. Um, he had his own business, it was small and uh, his first name was Kevin. And he was diagnosed at that time with what they called ARC, A-R-C, AIDS-related complex, which was like, you don't have full-blown AIDS, but you're kind of there. So they mm. called it ARC. But before that, they called it um, GRID, G-R-I-D, Gay-Related Immunodeficiency. Yeah. Um, so Kevin, I don't know, you know, I took him to the doctor and, you know, it wasn't a good prognosis. Right. So I don't know, a few days later they found him dead. And um, I eventually found out that he had taken his own life. <laughs> and I remember talking to his mom on the phone she called the catering company for some reason. And I said, you know, I'm very sorry about Kevin, great guy, very talented. And I asked her about funeral arrangements. I don't know, I just asked about funeral arrangements because yeah. someone just died. Yeah. And she told me, um, we don't plan on any. Mm. So, you know, talk about being a pariah. That happened to a lot of men, a lot of men. And then down the line, you know, a lot of, um, of women as well and um, sex workers and IV drug users. And, um, but that's what I remember the most from that time was um, people lost their jobs. Uh, employers would find out that you were in the hospital you know, and it would have been someone knew that you had AIDS or you're very sick. You know, lots of people lost their jobs. Um, here in Illinois, there was a lawmaker, Penny Pullen, and what year? Probably the early 80s. And uh, she was ferociously anti uh, gay or LGBT, you could say. And so her idea was. Um, to start quarantining um, people with HIV. So I don't really remember that word quarantine. I sort of remember um, talking about like in, interning people. So to me that meant like internment camps. Mm. And the one thing she did pass through was uh, for two or three years, any couple who wanted to get married both of them had to have an HIV test. Hmm. Oh, so this would have been 85 because that's when the HIV test came out. Yeah, 85 or so. And um, so that passed, that law passed. So, I mean, I don't know how many, thousands of people get married in Illinois, but all those people had to take those um, state funded tests <clears throat> 
And at that time, it was, uh, you know, $23 million across the state in 1980s dollars. And uh, in the two years, 23 people, they discovered had HIV. And then I also remember, because my dad used to watch that uh, William Buckley Jr. gentleman on, I think he was on public television. I don't remember the name of the show, but his idea was to tattoo people um, who were HIV, tested positive for HIV, or even if they were a gay or lesbian individual. And um, well, fortunately that never went anywhere um, as far as I go, as far as I know. Um, And I think there was some of some of the um, outcast or pariah attitude was also in the gay community. Uh, so my friend Kevin, who I just talked about, he um, one of his clients and a good friend of his. I, I brought something over to his place. Mm, I don't know something, um, and he told me I brought it up to his swank condo and he told me well i just donated 500 dollars to the lyric opera of chicago because i don't want to i don't want to support that dirty disease Mm -hmm. you know so it was from within the um community as well because a lot of people didn't know or understand and um yeah i mean well when I found out my diagnosis, I, I just, uh, I stayed in. I went to work and would come home and stayed in. I didn't socialize, you know. Um, I didn't want to meet anybody. And that was, you know, I was, I was afraid of, very afraid of rejection. And um, people could disclose your status, you know, to, to anybody um and then <clears throat> i don't in my opinion i don't think the government started getting serious about aids until it started affecting newborn infants you know because there was mother to child transmission right and you just have to look at ryan white you know he what i know he was in kokomo indiana yeah and um, but he was like, what, 14 or 15? And the school, he was a hemophiliac, became infected with the virus by uh, blood transfusion. But still, you know, parents and others, and probably school officials, didn't want him in school. Um, so which happened. And, you know, he's just like a 14-year-old boy. And, you know, it's they were concerned about bodily fluids. That's what I remember. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then he died, like, I don't know, four or five years later. And um, I just think, thank God for his parents, because they were so such advocates for people to understand the disease and not to, to treat these people um, as pariahs. Um, I went back and looked because I was just curious. Um, you know, I'm 41, so I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, graduated high school in 98. So I remember it. You lived this experience. I remember seeing it through news, seeing it through the commentary, seeing it more through the cultural debate part of it. So I got curious. I went back and looked. Uh, Pew actually has some of the data still in 1987. So this is two years after 85. This is kind of probably peak panic for lack of a better term because it's before we started having more understanding so 1987 these were the poll numbers on this stuff uh 78 percent of americans said all aids patients should be treated with compassion this would extrapolate to hiv as well i would assume 78 percent people said they these are americans treated with compassion that had aids and hiv but the numbers underneath that probably are going to be shocking to people now um 
60% agreed people with AIDS should be made to carry a card or some other identification that they had the virus. Uh, 46% said they only had themselves to blame. 51%, this is the Pew data from 1987, 51% said this was God's judgment and punishment against them. Uh, 33% agreed that employers should be able to fire people with AIDS or HIV without cause, other cause. 21% said AIDS patients should be isolated from the rest of society. That, that probably sounds like shocking stuff to us now, but that was the sentiment in 1987. You, can, you were well into your own treatments by that point. That sure seems to line up with some of your experiences. So when people act like this wasn't a major cultural issue, I grew up in very rural, very conservative West Virginia, and I knew a lot of this stuff because it was being talked about. How do you explain to somebody that's younger now that only has read about this, how dominating of culture and politics and health sciences this issue was in the 80s and towards the mid and late 90s? Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I think it was, a, uh, you know, it was, the, it was on the news. Um, I don't know if we had cable TV then. Um, but, you know, there, there was, would always be some kind of shock news about, you know, AIDS and um, then you know, Haitian immigrants brought it in. Um, you know, look, I think a lot of scapegoating, I think. Um, but everything, those numbers that you read, um, you know, carrying the ID card, I remember that being talked about. And, um, but the scariest thing was, I think in Illinois was that talking about internment camps. So yeah. um, I'm just thinking here for a second. Well, at first the mainstream media basically ignored it. I know the 1981, I, I don't know, June or September, there was a small article in the New York Times about um, gay men who were experiencing KS, Carpus's sarcoma, which is a skin cancer norm, um, normally found in dark skinned people who lived in the Mediterranean. But now it, it was affecting these, you know, all white guys, you know, and black guys, um, you know, who had lesions all over their face, you know. Most of those guys, you know, they would just stay indoors. Um, sometimes you would see, I would see these folks out and about and, you know, they wore like a lot of um, makeup and um, yeah, but there was like nothing you could do for it. And it wasn't until a couple years later that it appeared on the front page of the New York Times. And um, talking about, you know, ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, they had a, a ZAP, which is, what is a ZAP? It's getting, focusing on a group or a person or two. And they would like have their signs and shout slogans around that person or whatever. But they interrupted the, the um, broadcast for Dan Rather one night on the CBS News. Um, something about, you know, report, report AIDS fairly. And um, so a, a lot of people saw that. And I don't know what they thought. Oh, they probably thought, well, they probably thought, oh, there goes the fags again. And um, but yeah, I remember all that stuff that you mentioned. Yeah. And, you know, I'll give Chicago a lot of credit for um, not so much the city, but I think the LGBT community came. It, one thing AIDS did, I believe, is 
it really galvanized LGBT people, you know? Um, because then, you know, you know, people wanted um, gay rights and stuff, but nothing, nothing was really passing. They couldn't pass a human rights ordinance is what they called it in Chicago here. Oh, it took a, two or three votes um, to pass that. And it, it only happened, I think, is because the community at that time sort of, this was a wake up call for them and they galvanized themselves to push through that ordinance, so. What do you, when you're looking back on it now, you know, a couple more numbers that are really shocking. In 1988, 68% of Americans thought AIDS was the most pressing health issue in America at the time. That's more than two thirds. That's a shockingly high number. By 2008, it was polling at less than 1% and has been undetectable in polling ever since as a health issue. Uh, it kind of peaked out about 2000 or so was the last time it was the number one issue, health issue for the country. That's got to be kind of a, a good thing, bad thing for you, too, though, isn't it? Because one is that sh that shows a lot of progress. Uh, on the other hand, as a long term HIV survivor, uh, do you see with that progress, maybe the narrative has changed or history has kind of dulled what that experience was for you? How do you how do you view it now that you've got a little distance from it? The country's kind of moved. I don't want to say moved on from it, but it's not the issue it was then. People see it differently. How do you see it? Because you have that unique perspective of, hey, this is my life. I shouldn't be alive from where I thought I was. You said I thought this was a death sentence when I got it. You still have the envelope. So obviously it's a meaningful to you. Do you see that less than 1% as a positive? Do you see it as a negative? How does that land for you? Oh, wow. Um, so... In 2000, the percentage was down, right? Of people yeah. seeing it as a. That was the last year it was the number. Threat. That was the last year it was the number one issue in poll. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I think, I think a part of that is um, what happened in 1995. So in 1995, uh, they came up, the drug companies came up with what is called a protease inhibitor. Mm hmm. I don't know all the science to it, but it prevents the virus from replicating. So people were started taking it and they walked out of the hospital. You know, if they were sick at home, they started taking these protease inhibitors and, you know, so people went back to work. Um, people went back to like their normal social lives, you know, eight steps, um, I, I don't know if I want to say plummeted, but AIDS deaths uh, were really reduced. So I think um, sort of like, I guess no news is good news <laughs> because sure. people were, were living, were starting to live. And um, now I think one of the, and, and a couple organizations I'm involved with is how do we deal with all these people like me who are long-term survivors who are you know so I'm 63 um you know what's going to happen to these people um you know most of them thought that they were going to be dead and uh so the question is, I don't is sort of like, where do the where do where do where do they put us? Maybe, yeah. Um, where do they put us? Uh, here in Chicago, there's Howard Brown Health Center. It's been around since '74, and um, you know they came together and did. I think at the time, at each time, everything they could to help people with HIV AIDS. And now in the past couple of years, um, they're focusing on how to 
how to address the needs of aging uh, HIV folks. Uh, and they're like they refocus their uh, case management um, and they're hiring case managers to assist people, elderly people. Um, I don't know, some people don't like the word elderly, <laughs> but um, you're seniors. pretty thrilled about it though, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> But, um, Beats the alternative, you know, my dad always said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, you know, so they're starting to, you know, help people out. Um, find them housing, you know, because there's a lot of indigent long-term survivors, I think. Yeah. And working on building them um, community housing. We already have one. LGBT and other people housing buildings here, not far from where I live here. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm not sure what will happen, but what's happening they're finding, and I try to follow it, is that long-term HIV survivors we're getting um, we're getting medical conditions earlier. Yeah. So uh, like arthritis. So yeah. I have really, I have moderate to severe arthritis in my knees and ankles, you know, um, which isn't really supposed to happen for, you know, I don't know, a few more years. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, a lot of people problems with, um, High blood press, pressure, cardiovascular disease. Sure. Um, so it's, I'm looking for the word here. It's, um, it's, it's more intense sure. for people like my age with HIV than someone my age who does not, who is not infected with HIV. Yeah. And, you know, so you know, we'll see what happens. Let's give folks a little bit of hope though. So you're a long-term survivor. You've done this for many, many years. We now know with data that we're going to have these people that are going to be long haul COVID symptoms of various kinds. Uh, I'm sure this disease, we, we've we gone through the science really, really fast, which has been part of the cultural problems. It's almost the inverse of the problems you had with AIDS where it was very slow trying to get the science. Uh, what would you say to those people now that are looking at a changed lifetime of health from this pandemic? They're looking at maybe years, maybe the rest of their lives trying to deal with this stuff. You've done it. Uh, you survived the unsurvivable, like you said, when you said you had a death sentence. Uh, that's certainly what I was told when we were kids that, hey, HIV, it's a death sentence. Don't get that. What would you tell these COVID folks now that are looking at it as a comparison of, hey, you can do this. You can survive this disease. Uh, give them a little bit of hope and what you have been doing in your advocacy over these many years to encourage people that are dealing with health issues like this, where the science is evolving, where they are looking at a lifetime of things, but yes, you can do it and you can survive. I'm sure. Well, on the Phil, Phil Donahue show in the late eighties, he had a, a, his, one of his guests was a physician. His name is Dr. Bernie Siegel. At the time, he was a well-renowned uh, physician for cancer patients. And three things he said that uh, I, I agreed with and had, you know followed was what I just said, educate yourself about the disease. Yeah. Find a good doctor who you can trust. And, um, you know, some kind of spirituality yeah you know to help you out but out of all those with a long-term covid patient now yeah i would focus on yeah educating yourself about the disease because now with the internet you know yeah you have to be careful but there's so much covid related stuff and i think people have to be become activists and put pressure on the government, the FDA or the NIH, 
and see what are we doing for long-term COVID people? You know, is there anything in the drug pipeline coming down the line that would assist you in the future and advocate, advocate for that? So that's easy, easier said than done because, you know, if you're really hit with long-term COVID, you're not going to, I don't think I would be, you know, an activist, but I don't know, maybe your wife or husband or children or yeah. friends would be, there's no, um, I don't know of any activist COVID presence for treatments for long-term COVID. Yeah. Because we're just going to it and this has gone so fast. Again, it's almost the opposite of the AIDS where it was a lot of it was in the dark. There, of course, there's pre-internet, so you're relying on traditional media. They were very slow to pick it up. Um, it's almost the inverse where this COVID and the science and the data, it's gone so fast and we got the vaccines relatively quickly. It's really almost the inverse where you you folks in, with the HIV and AIDS communities it took 20 years, 15, 20 years to really get effective treatments for these folks. It, it's very interesting that people would even try to compare the two because in, in that respect, at least the sign, they're almost mirror opposites, aren't they? Yeah, I am. Um, well, for myself, I don't think too much about comparisons yeah. between HIV and COVID. I mean, there probably are. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think what I was going to say. Yeah, it seems to me that... Oh, I, dealing... I know. No, go ahead. Oh, activism. I think that is one thing that is unappreciated is that activism by um, groups such as ACT UP, New York or Los Angeles or Chicago. Um, I'll just use them as the example. You know, who put a lot of pressure on the FDA to, uh, for example, expedited, pro expedited process of medications that looks like they could work. Um, yeah. Compassionate use of drugs. Yes. And they do this now for all, for many types of diseases. You know, there's, um, just let, you know, the person, their uh, prognosis is not good at all. And if there's something that they can try that might help them, you know, um, you know, we have that now and it's very important. And I think a lot of the research into HIV AIDS led the way for uh, rapid development of the COVID vaccines. Yeah. By, um, by you know, um, massive research, expedited approval, the Merck pill that people are talking about now. I don't know, but it's, um, they studied it, but they, not, not for too long though. I wish I knew the exact time, but um, you know, it's gonna be approved. I, it's a, approved in the UK. Yeah. So it, it, it will hit here sometime. Yeah. When, when you kind of look at all this together, um, it seems to me the cultural aspect of this, which is what the early HIV AIDS and the LGBT community had to kind of fight through to get to the science and the healthcare part. It seems like the way to me to keep that from being an issue forward is not just getting hung up on the science, not just getting hung up on the culture, not just getting hung up on the healthcare of it, but keeping this as a people focused thing. And I, I think part of the problem with the COVID debate we're having now is we're getting caught up in a lot of stuff and we're forgetting we're dealing with people. And especially you're talking about, well, we're over 750,000 dead in America. That's a lot of people. We're talking about long-term people. That's a lot of people. Um, can you just speak to that briefly to kind of put a bow on this is one of the reasons you started out talking about what a pariah meant that happens when you stop seeing people as people and you start seeing them as a problem to solve or a disease to cure or something to keep away from everybody else. Uh, you've done a lot of activism over the years. 
isn't that the key to a lot of this is treating people as people and respecting them as people, then whatever the issue is or the political issue or the healthcare is issue follows after that? Uh, yes, um, I agree. Uh, you know, yeah, people, people on all sides of the spectrum, you know, need to look um, at each other and realize, you know, she's a mom, he's a dad, they have children, yeah. they have grandchildren, and, and just see them for who they are and drop the, oh, you live in a red state and the blue states are against us. And, um, you know, I think that should happen. People need to look at each other as neighbors, you know, uh, neighbors um, helping each other. But then, um, but I, I don't know how that could happen. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think if, let's say, like the media and social media could bring it down a notch with the constant, uh, chaos and divisiveness um you know i don't know sometimes on twitter i i hear people and oh i'm not watch oh this guy's on tv and you know you know so sometimes i'll just tweet turn it off yeah you know a, a lot of these folks out there that are rapidly against other people for who they are, you know, turn them off. And, yeah. and I, I don't mean um, that cancel, cancel culture stuff. Um, I don't even know what that is really. <laughs> uh, I don't think they do either. It's okay. But it, but I think you, you got the point though, is like, you know, we're media is responsive to us. And if we keep demanding that kind of stuff, they're going to keep feeding it to us. So it's, it's very much a star of the beast thing where, um, you know, it, this is one of those things, it's a big problem, but it's going to have to start with the individual level. And you're just going to have to do a little better in what you consume and how you treat the people around you and kind of go from there. Cause you can't control the rest of it. But I think you're right. It, you know, the me media didn't do that because they wanted to, they did that because that's where the audience went. So it, it part of the blame's got to be on us and what we consume. And that's why we do shows like this, where uh, instead of just reacting to the outrage machine, when, when these comments about AIDS and HIV in the eighties and nineties were made, we reached out to talk to you and to find out and to listen and to learn those of us that didn't experience that. And uh, it was a long time ago. I hate to tell you that, but it's uh, a lot of people been born since may not even know, may not know anything at all about it. So that's why we do this and why I appreciated your time today. I know it's a very tough topic for you and it's personal to you, but thank you so very much, uh, David. Uh, you're David Damien on Twitter. That's how I got to know you and we got to be Twitter yes, buddies right. and friends. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, people follow you on there. And just as kind of a final thought, though, is uh, uh, – it would have been real easy for you to just go in a hole or just stay home. Like you said, why are you on Twitter? Why, why do you poke your head out into the wider world? Just as kind of a way to put an end to this, you know, how can somebody like me become a friend of yours? Like we have, you know, why, why do you do that? Because it would have been real easy for you to just kind of do the fetal position and try to hang on. Uh, but you're on Twitter, you're on social media, despite those bad things you say, why is that? What do you think you're finding and accomplishing out there with that? Well, um, <clears throat> so in the past couple months, I've stopped, I've lessened my screen time. Yeah. Um, with like Twitter. And I first signed up by Twitter to, um, it was, for me, it was a good source of news from yeah. all kinds of different places and all kinds of different topics. And I think, um, yeah, I got on Twitter to, yeah, become more informed. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I don't tweet too much anymore. Um, so, um, 
but with this, what I, I this will make sense. But I have an old uh, priest friend of mine. He's a he's an old he's a monk. He's like eighty nine, and he he always tells me, um, whenever you come across some kind of problem or situation, um, you can surely bet that the one thing it comes down to is money. Hmm. And I think um, this like chaos on social media, you know, chaos sells. Yeah. You no, know, they used to say sex sells. It, it still does. But now chaos sells. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I'll see what my future holds for me regarding Twitter, but um, it's it's very important to me for some reason to be informed. I've been like that my whole life. Yeah, you know, when I was like third grade, I'm checking out ten books from the library. <laughs> um, so. I don't know. That's kind of my thoughts about that. Good. Does that help? It does. And I'm just glad you were on Twitter because that's how I got to know you. So if nothing else, I got that out of you just on a personal level. I got to know you. So thank you for being on Twitter. And uh, more importantly, uh, thank you for taking the time today to talk through this. What can be a really touchy issue can be a hard issue. Obviously, it's a personal issue to you. But uh, I appreciate you sharing it. And hopefully folks maybe got a little different point of view on the past and how it very much can affect the present. And hopefully we learn plenty on what to do in the future as we all go forward together as humanity. Yeah. And uh, well, I have to thank you. You know, you have such great tweets. <laughs> um, Thanks. You do, you know, and where would we be without Twitter supper club? Oh, I love it so much. It, it, so something as simple as putting what you're eating to dinner and it just it's kind of blown it actually trends every night now i get i, I got a, somebody the other day is like hey you know that's on the trend list every night now right i was like i had no idea and he was like sure enough it was on the trend bar so but it you know that was something i you know again i was just something i did for me just to, i was like i need some good on my timeline and uh people responded to it and i i we have to do the culture and politics stuff that's a sense of duty thing i feel like i need to do that and that, yeah that means you deal with a lot of ugly stuff but that's a pleasant thing and yeah everybody's got to eat uh so it's a way to bring people together and i love it and uh, i'm glad you're a participant i'm glad you're still with us uh but mostly sir i just really appreciate you sharing this story so thank you very much my friend and uh we'll talk again soon in the future yes we will all right. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Nineteen eighty-six. One of the turning points of the HIV and AIDS crisis was C. Everett Koop issued a report to the Reagan administration, and it ended up becoming a pamphlet that was sent to every home in America. And one of the real important quotes of that was when he said, "This we are fighting a disease, not people." Those who are already afflicted are sick people and need our care, as do all sick patients. The country must face this epidemic as a unified society. We must prevent the spread of AIDS while at the same time preserving our humanity and intimacy. Now, those words go back to the 80s and 90s and the AIDS and HIV crisis that we talked about with David, but it's true today, too. When we're talking about COVID or whatever the next crisis after that's going to be, we can never lose our humanity. We get wrapped up in the figures and the policies and the debates. And we forget that there's a lot of people involved here. The highest death rate for AIDS that peaked out was about 40,000 people. COVID has about 750,000 dead and counting as of the date of this. Things that are different are not the same, but the principles of treating each other with dignity and compassion and understanding that we're all still humans and that we have mortality to deal with no matter who we are is something we need to all do better at. And it'll help us deal with issues, whether they be COVID or remembering the AIDS and HIV crisis that still to this day affects 1.2 million Americans. That's it for this edition of Herd Tell. Hope you got something from this. Appreciate our guest, David Hummel. He has been a good Twitter buddy. Make sure you follow him. And I really appreciate him because this was not an easy topic for him. I'm sure it was hard, but I think it's a worthwhile 
issue to deal with, especially since it kind of blew up into an outrage and we get to actually turn down the noise on it, which is what we want to do here on Hertel and hear from a human being and hear their story and maybe hopefully see things in a little bit different light. Wherever you're listening to this, whether you're listening to the podcast version or watching on YouTube, if you could leave a comment and a rating, if you get the option to do that, that's very important. It lets people know that our program is worth checking out. If you really liked it, you want to do us a favor, share it on your social media. Let folks know where to find us. We'd really sure appreciate it. We'll keep doing it as long as you keep listening. And wherever you are across the street around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. Until we talk to you next time, y'all take care. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com.